Hey everyone, we posted a couple days ago on social media about how both John and I are a bit under the weather right now, so we've got to delay this week's scheduled episode covering Melissa Brannon's case until next Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. But today, we're re-releasing an episode that's near and dear to our hearts. It's a case we covered over a year ago, back when our format for this podcast was very different than it is today. This is a story that's continued to stick with us, in part due to our interview with Jerry, Teresa Corley's sister, which provided us so much insight into not only Teresa's case, but all the work Jerry continues to put in, trying to get justice for her sister nearly 45 years later. If you could please do us a huge favor and share this episode on your socials, that would be amazing. We want Teresa's story to reach as many ears as possible. And please, take a minute to follow the Facebook page that Jerry runs, which is dedicated to Teresa's case. It's called Justice for Teresa Corley, Bellingham, MA, 1978. Jerry posts on there pretty regularly with updates. Thanks so much for listening to Teresa's case, and we'll be back with a new episode next week. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts. I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today, we have a very special episode for you. We're going to be covering the 1978 murder of Teresa Corley. As I researched this case, I became incredibly invested, but also frustrated by the lack of accurate reporting. There's so much contradictory information out there, and most details were seriously lacking. As I professed my aggravation with trying to find credible sources on this case to John, I stumbled upon the Justice for Teresa Corley Facebook page, and we figured, what harm could come from reaching out to Teresa's sister Jerry, who runs that page? We wanted to see if she would be interested in talking to us about her sister's case, and luckily, she was more than willing to, and spoke with us at length. It turns out that, ever since she created Justice for Teresa Corley, Jerry has been an unrelenting force, constantly pushing forward for answers. Without her taking the time to speak with us, while going over everything she's worked her ass off to uncover, our research would have been left to mostly inaccurate reports and poorly written articles aside from a few outlying sources. By melding the details investigators have released to the public, with the first-hand knowledge put forth by Jerry, we believe we've been able to piece together a comprehensive look into this case. So without further ado, today's episode is about the murder of Teresa Corley. By December 8, 1978, Teresa had been missing for four days, and hopes for her safe return home had begun to wane. As the investigation into her disappearance continued, police received a tip that would change her family's lives forever. Authorities responded to the area of I-495 in Bellingham, Massachusetts, after hearing word that a man had found a deceased female lying nude in a ditch along the highway. This woman would later be identified as Teresa Corley shattering the hope her family had so desperately clung to. What happened during those four days since she went missing? Who would do this to her? Why wasn't anybody talking? These are the types of questions that must be answered, but we can't get to our conclusion without first starting from the beginning. Teresa was in the sixth grade when her mother moved the family from Mattapan, which is near the Boston area, to Bellingham, Massachusetts. She wanted to give her kids a better childhood after their father had become estranged and thought that time spent living in a small town would be better than that of the bustling city life. Teresa was the seventh of nine total children and one of eight girls. She only had one brother, John. Imagine that poor kid. He must have had it rough living with all those women. Jerry shed some light on what things were like for the family as they made this big move. So my mother got social security and she was able actually to purchase a house in Bellingham, mm-hmm. um, okay. you know, to be able to afford to. And did you enjoy it more in Bellingham than, than living in the city or vice versa? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was an adjustment because when, <laughs> for, I think for all of us, because when you're in the city, you know, even at that young age, you have to be a little tougher. Yeah. Um, you know, the, you know, not, there were racial issues in which we were getting beat up. <laughs> in the city and then you right. move to the little tiny town and, oh wait a minute people don't hit people to get what they want <laughs> right. so I, right. you know and we all had to adjust in that way mm-hmm. um, 
know, we were all pretty well behaved and, and, and towed the line and we, we adjusted because yeah. you adjust to your environment, but we were all the same way. We, you know, we, we, we enjoyed our, our new house and, you know, anyway. Okay. And as people will recall, it was like the blizzard of, um, 78. Yep. It was like the most, you know, magical time. Sure makes perfect sense to me why her mother would have wanted to make this change. Now, as anyone can guess, moving at such a pivotal age must have been tough, but Jerry remembers how her sister was so good at making friends and how everyone would just gravitate towards her. She went on to say that the two had a relationship like that of many sisters. Jerry, being younger, followed in Teresa's footsteps, acting like her little shadow, wanting to be just like her big sis. Sure, they had their little catfights and tiffs, but... At the end of the day, they loved each other. As Teresa moved into high school, she became involved in group activities like the volleyball team and drama club. She went on to produce a play that's believed to have been titled The Defenseless Victim, which would prove to be ironic as our story continues. Jerry made mention Teresa still had that tough city girl vibe, feeling like no harm could come to her. Outside of her extracurricular activities, Teresa was a very hardworking young woman, While still in high school, she started working at the local star market to save up to pay her way through college, eventually leaving this job and taking an opening at Penthouse Sales, which was a jute factory in Franklin, Mass. Penthouse Sales specialized in creating things like espadrille shoes and things of that nature. At the time, Teresa was now attending Holliston Junior College and studying for a medical assistant degree, presumably as a stepping stone towards a dream of working as a pediatrician one day. However, as dedicated as Teresa was to her job and her schooling, towards the end of her high school career, she had started to fall in with a bad crowd, particularly with two girls named Pam and Alana, whom Teresa would end up working with at this new job at Penthouse Sales. The three became so close that others would call them the three amigos. Jerry told us that Teresa had never been the type to drink a lot or do drugs, but after she started hanging around with these new friends, there was a marked change in her sister's attitude. I saw a change in her with those girls. Um, you know, everybody back, underage drinking was a thing back then too, mm-hmm. right? So, but the night that she went out, the, the drinking age was actually 18. But I remember even, we, we would have a party at the house and they'd, they'd be offering me a beer and it's like, you know, I'm good. Mm-hmm. We, you, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But um, it was beer drinking. And then when she started hanging around with these girls, I noticed she was more kind of glazy eyed, and I'm thinking, and I, I wasn't into like the smoking of the pot and all of that. And so I was like, you know, straight and narrow, you know, trying to Sounds be a like girl. And, <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and it was like, I just didn't, it wasn't my thing. It wasn't the people I hung around with. I wasn't the party girl, but I saw her changing from the girl I knew to after being with these two girls, the party girl. Clearly, Jerry had the right idea because the night Teresa would disappear, she was hanging with this exact same crew. On the evening of December 4th, 1978, 19-year-old Teresa finished her shift at Penthouse Sales around 7 p.m. and went on to meet up with Jerry and their mother, who'd come to pick her up from work in the family car, as they often did. But on this day, Teresa told them that she wouldn't be coming along, and she'd made plans to go out with her friends. She went on to say they'd be going to a party nearby and acknowledged her mother's request to be home on time, which wasn't an issue. Teresa was never late. As Jerry and her mother were about to head out, Teresa mentioned to them to let her little brother John know that she hadn't forgotten about him. It was his birthday that day, and she was going to be surprising him with concert tickets. The three would go on to say goodbye and went their separate ways. After Teresa and her friends show up at the party, it seems like everyone decided to change venue from the apartment and move to a local spot known as the Train Stop Bar, located on Depot Street in Franklin. This is where a lot of the discrepancies in what's been reported started popping up, but with Jerry's help, we've pieced together a more accurate timeline of events. So everyone heads over to the Train Stop Bar, the important people to our story being Teresa's core group of friends. You've got Pam, Alana, and our boyfriend Rick. Jerry told us that Teresa didn't date much and had never really brought guys home. It turns out that Rick was only the second guy she'd ever dated, and her first boyfriend wasn't in the picture anymore. So as you can imagine, they get to the bar and Teresa's drinking, having fun, taking some much-needed time away from her responsibilities. However, things don't stay lighthearted and chill in the bar that night, and Teresa ends up getting into a heated argument with Rick, 
which isn't very surprising once you find out the type of person this guy is. In short, he was a drug dealer from Franklin that had been slinging quaaludes at the time. Yeah, if you're like me, you've got no clue what the heck a quaalude is. Yeah, the only reason I know what they are is because of Scarface and Wolf of Wall Street. I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be a sleep aid, but was super addictive and turned out to have more recreational use than anything else. I guess if you took one and you fought the urge to fall asleep, you'd get super high. So, as far as the argument goes, it's believed, based off statements from people who are at the bar, that Teresa was upset for two reasons. The first being that Rick's ex-girlfriend, Karen, had shown up to the bar and he was being all flirtatious with her. Ew. But this other reason, which was actually brought forward by Karen, is even worse. Supposedly, the thing that sent Teresa over the edge was when she saw Rick making out with another girl. Yeah, no shit she was pissed. Any 19-year-old girl would be thrown into a jealous rage at that point. But get this, the girl he'd been making out with was Pam, one of Teresa's best friends. Like what? Some frickin' friend? You can bet your booty I'd be mad as hell if it were me in her situation. But the accuracy of these statements are still up for debate. I mean, how reliable are these people providing the information? We find out later that Karen had apparently been talking crap to Rick about Teresa, saying she was bad news and even went on to tell people that she knew what happened to Teresa that night. But when asked by police, she made claims that she had visions about what happened. So... For all we know, this chick could have been making stuff up about how Pam was making out with Rick. Either way, this whole argument takes place and Teresa, obviously hurt and upset by Rick and her friend's actions, wants to leave the bar. She apparently tells Rick something along the lines of, I'll show you. It's not exactly clear what she meant by that. Was she going to tattle on his drug dealing or maybe go do the same thing he'd been doing and find some other guy to make out with? Who knows, but... After this, Teresa would approach her other friend, Alana, and asked if she'd give her a ride home. And Alana's response? She says no, that she doesn't want to leave the party yet. Uh, okay, that's not rude at all. Seems like Jerry's feelings about these girls were right all along. They are clearly not good friends. As much as we can hate on Alana for not wanting to leave, she could have been totally oblivious to what happened. And come on, you know how drunk teens are. She was probably only interested in her own desires at that point anyway. But I do agree with you. It doesn't seem like she was a great friend. The thing that just aggravates me the most about Alana refusing to take Teresa home is that she knew Teresa didn't have a car with her. So if she's going to be leaving the bar and you're refusing to take her home, then you've got to know she'll be leaving alone and on foot. I know my best friend would not let me leave a bar in the middle of the night all by myself. True. At a minimum, she could have just left for a few minutes to bring Teresa home and came right back to the bar. Right? The distance between the bar and Teresa's house was only five and a half miles or just under nine kilometers. Making that drive would have only cost her 20 minutes of her night. But instead, she left her friend hanging and that long walk would end up costing Teresa everything. I get that Alana didn't have any obligation to take Teresa home, but they were friends And now, with everything that's happened, I can only imagine she wishes she'd made a different decision. So, Teresa begins this journey home, mind you, after she had gotten pretty drunk while at the bar. According to friends who were later interviewed, she was in no shape to be walking home alone. While making her way down the street, she was approached by a vehicle occupied by four men. Thanks to Jerry, we learned that these individuals' names were Mike, Steve, David, and John. And no, not her little brother. This guy is totally unrelated. I think it's fair to assume that these four guys approaching a lone female seen meandering through the street surely seems like bad news. But what's even more suspicious is that it turns out all of these men were at the train stop bar at the same time Teresa was. Could they have seen how bad of shape she was in and decide to follow her out of the bar? Now, that hasn't been proven as fact, but it really makes you wonder what their intentions were. We learn from Jerry that apparently at some point, after seeing Teresa walking, Mike made a comment to the other guys in the car about wanting to pick her up because he wanted to have sex with her. That's, uh, brazen. I know. I was like, what the hell? She's not some piece of meat you can just pick up for your own sick pleasures. But get this. His friends stop the freaking car and pick her up right after he says this. 
and Teresa, being none the wiser to Mike's disturbing thoughts, gets into the car with the four men. It's unclear if she did so willingly or if she was forced in, but either way, she's in the car and traveling along with them to their destination, which was an apartment complex known as the Presidential Arms, located on Route 140 in Franklin. Again, being unclear, it's believed that during the ride, these guys mention to Teresa that they're going to a party and either invite her or force her to come along. A short time later, they arrive at the complex, which was only about a five-minute drive. Once they arrive at the Presidential Arms, all five would head up to one of the apartments in the complex. There are two slightly differing stories of what happens next. One comes from Steve, and the other is from Mike's female cousin, who was potentially at the apartment they were going to, or may have heard the story later from Mike. Again, another unclear detail. But right off the bat, this makes me think that certain details have probably been left out in their retelling of this story. Yeah, it's almost like a game of telephone. You've got to take bits and pieces of each and try to figure out the real story. Exactly. So from what's been told, once they all arrived at the apartment, Mike apparently gets all gross and weird again like he had been in the car and starts talking about all the sexual things he wanted to do with Teresa. Like, dude, come on. Nobody wants to hear that crap especially Teresa. I can only imagine how uncomfortable this must have made her feel. It was so bad that even the other guys seem to have had enough, and they kick Mike out of the apartment. This whole situation is crazy, and I feel bad that Teresa ended up here, probably feeling like she had no way out at this point. I know, it just goes to show you how one small thing, like not getting a ride home from a friend, can send things spiraling out of control. So, of course, Mike's not thrilled about being kicked out of the apartment. He's probably drunk himself at this point, having just left the bar, and now he's all horned up thinking, for some entitled reason, that he was going to get lucky with Teresa. So he starts banging on the door like a madman, trying to get back in. From what Mike's cousin had said, he was, quote, trying to help Teresa. But based on what we know so far, Mike certainly doesn't seem like some white knight riding in to save a damsel in distress. He was just talking about violating this girl. Why should we believe that he's now trying to help her? The only thing I can think of is that the stories we've been led to believe about Mike are fabricated. Perhaps he had an actual attraction to Teresa outside of sexual, and the other guys in the car were the horned dogs looking to take advantage of her. If that were the case, maybe Mike didn't want her to be alone with these other guys out of fear for what they might do to her? Regardless of the reasons behind Mike's removal from the apartment and subsequent attempts to regain entry... Teresa is now inside, with all of these other guys, and possibly even more based on information that's spread around later. Now is probably the time where the potential dangers of her situation began to sink in, as it's alleged that she says something along the lines of, I'll have sex with all of you if you let me go. She must have been terrified, feeling trapped and believing that these guys were about to have their way with her, against her will. I can only imagine that she'd say something like this, thinking that if she took part in things voluntarily, that her assailants would do her no further harm. What a fucking terrible position to be in. And all because Alana wouldn't give her a ride home. This is why we need to look out for our friends, guys. It sickens me that this all could have been avoided had her friend just done her a solid that night, instead of only thinking about her own urges at the time. I think it should be mentioned, though, that since everything has happened, Alana's been pretty guilt-stricken by her actions. Deservedly so. I'd carry that shit with me the rest of my life. You and me both. She was apparently so hysterical at Teresa's funeral that she was kicked out by Teresa's mother. You know, there's an appropriate time and place for her to be upset, and it's not at the funeral for the friend you just left hanging. Ugh, I know. But enough dunking on Alana. Let's continue. At this point in the timeline, it's believed that the sexual assault Teresa had feared allegedly took place, and when she finally had the opportunity, she fled from the apartment. As she makes her escape, her mind is left reeling, completely and totally traumatized from what had just happened to her. When leaving the complex, it's theorized that Teresa had taken a right turn and began heading west on Route 140, eventually crossing the street. At the time, 140 was only a two-lane road without much infrastructure around, making it easier for Teresa to cross, especially in her rattled state. A short time later, she's reportedly seen leaning on a guardrail that nowadays borders a stop-and-shop grocery store, but back in 78 had no notable landmarks nearby. Once she was able to collect herself, Teresa began her trek home. 
The next part of our timeline is, unfortunately, surrounded by a lot of misinformation and speculation. While Teresa is trying to get home, she's picked up by at least two different people, which Jerry was able to confirm. It seems like there are also rumors out there of a third person maybe being involved, but as far as we can tell, only two have been confirmed. So, Teresa had been walking westbound on Route 140 and was observed resting against that guardrail at some point. Later on, as she's continuing to walk down the road, she was seen by a Gorelick Farms employee that was headed into work, which was located on this same road. This guy, while in his personal vehicle, picks Teresa up and drives her about a mile closer to her destination, dropping her off in front of the Gorelick Farms building. As this first guy left and headed into work, Teresa must have lingered in the area for a bit. A short time later, another driver for Gorelick Farms, leaving to start his route, spots Teresa near the entrance and offers her a ride. According to our research, the second guy eventually came forward about helping Teresa, and during an interview with police, said that she smelled of alcohol and that she was, quote, mad as fire. You're damn right she was. This girl had just been through hell. She even went on to tell this driver about what had happened in the apartment, leading him to drop her off in front of the Bellingham Police Department. It seems like Teresa was ready to tell authorities about what had transpired inside the presidential arms. Something that I found interesting, which Jerry brought to our attention, had to do with these Gorelick Farms workers. Apparently, at least in the 70s, there was a rule that employees were not allowed to pick up hitchhikers. Sure, this wouldn't have been an issue for the first guy that was in his own car, but for the second driver, he probably could have had some serious backlash coming for him from his employer if word got out about what he'd done. So, I gotta say, people like him give me hope. It's commendable that he was willing to take on disciplinary action in order to help the investigation. And I know what you're all thinking. Was this delivery driver telling the truth and did police vet him? Well, they did, and they even took his DNA. He was also re-interviewed several years ago, but nothing ever came of it. So my guess is that it didn't match anything they had and he's been left alone ever since. This poor guy, though, he says he feels so much guilt for what happened and that his biggest regret is not driving her all the way home. But back to Teresa, who was now standing in front of the freaking police station. How is it that she's dropped off here, a place where she should have been safe, yet is found dead off the side of the highway a few days later? Well, apparently, she never made her way into the station to speak with officers, and her movements from this point on aren't entirely clear with there being no definitive sightings going forward. It's believed that around 5 a.m. on what was now December 5th, 1978, Teresa left the area of the police station, heading northwest. Being the dead of winter and so early in the morning, one would assume that there wouldn't be many people out and about, but several people came forward stating that they saw someone matching Teresa's description walking in this area around this time. The last person to report seeing someone that could have been Teresa stated that she was outside of a Dairy Queen, which would have only been a mile or one and a half kilometers from her home on North Main Street in Bellingham. Back in 1978, the Bellingham Police Station was located where the now Bellingham Municipal Center is. So I looked up the distance between the PD, where Teresa was dropped off, and the Dairy Queen located in Bellingham Center, and learned that it was literally only a four or five minute walk from one to the other. So it's clear that if this was Teresa, she hadn't made it very far. As we chatted with Jerry about the circumstances surrounding Teresa's situation, she too agreed that her sister couldn't have gotten very far, but made note that when Teresa was supposedly spotted outside the Dairy Queen, it was 5.30 a.m. So it took her 30 minutes to make a five-minute walk? You'd have to imagine that for this to be the case, maybe she was still intoxicated and staggered by the trauma of what had happened to her at the apartment, or maybe she had also been drugged. Jerry had mentioned that her sister was not a heavy drug user, but there have been claims that Teresa may have had quaaludes in her system at the time of her death. But the toxicology report has, to our knowledge, never been released. So even though it took her some time, Teresa was making her way closer and closer to home. Hell, at this point, she was practically right around the corner. But as Jerry, John, and their mother got out of bed on the morning of December 5th, they discovered that Teresa wasn't in her room. She had never made it home. The fact that she was absent was an immediate cause for concern. 
They began calling her older sisters, who no longer lived among them, and they too knew this was completely out of the ordinary and hurried to meet at the house in Bellingham. Family spread word of Teresa's disappearance to her friends, asking if anyone knew her whereabouts. Having no luck, the Corleys knew what had to be done and contacted police. Jerry told us that right off the bat, police told her family the same thing we always hear. They hem and hawed about how she hadn't been missing for 24 hours yet, she's a teenager, she'd come home soon. Yeah, 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 I can literally hear the cops telling them this in my head. We all know what they should have been doing. They should have been getting out into the community to look for this missing girl. I am so glad things have gotten better in regards to early reporting these days. Sure, we still hear stories like this every now and then, but it feels as though they're few and far between compared to the almost constant during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. After notifying police and being told they needed to wait, multiple friends and family members began feverishly searching the area for Teresa. Now, what happens next had my jaw on the floor. So, while speaking with Jerry, she tells us that Pam and Alana make their way to the Corleys' home while most people are out searching. Remember, these are supposedly Teresa's best friends. Hard to believe with one having made out with her boyfriend the night before and the other refusing to give her a ride home after the fight with Rick. So, they get to the house, but they're not alone. They decided to, uh, bring a friend. Some random guy named Jeff. Upon their arrival, the girls are very obviously stoned. They all head in, and as Jeff sits on one of the chairs, Pam and Alana proceed to drape themselves all up on him. And get this, they start making out in front of everyone in the house. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, but what? Your friend, who you both screwed over the night before, is now missing. Is this a sick joke? When Jerry went on to explain that these chicks weren't concerned at all about their missing friend, I lost it. Yeah, when I heard about these antics and then learned that Alana acted like a buffoon at Teresa's funeral, I lost any sympathy I had for her for the guilt she felt for not driving Teresa home. 100%. This is absolute bullshit. I cannot even believe people would have the audacity to act like this. It's sickening behavior. Sadly, this messed up situation with Pam and Alana wouldn't be the only aggravation the Corleys had to deal with while yearning for Teresa's return. As the 24-hour mark passed, police became serious about their search for the missing girl. And around this time, the Corleys began receiving strange phone calls. An unidentified person kept calling their house, claiming they were from California, asking if Teresa was home. As we were chatting with Jerry, this brought us right back to our Amy Mahalovic episode, in which her parents experienced similar calls that turned out to be coming from a mentally ill person just trying to mess with the family. We were curious if this was the same type of situation, but it seems like nothing ever came of the calls made to the Corleys, and they eventually stopped. Three agonizing days would pass before Teresa's body was discovered. On December 8, 1978, a man who identified himself as John Burlington contacted police after stumbling upon her remains. He stated that he'd pulled over to use the bathroom on the side of I-495 northbound in Bellingham when he observed Teresa's nude, lifeless body lying in a ditch some distance from the roadway. One thing I found odd about this John Burlington phone call was that he apparently described himself as a businessman traveling from Connecticut while speaking with the dispatcher. Is that a common thing for call takers at the police department to ask you what you do for a living? No, I wouldn't say so. I'd imagine that the reason this came up is that the dispatcher, or whoever talked to him, was smart enough to ask him what he was doing there. So this guy was probably like, oh, I'm a businessman traveling from Connecticut and I had to stop off to pee, or something like that. Mm, that's true. Now, I'm going to hold myself back from ranting about how many people we've discussed having found bodies on the side of the road while going to the bathroom. But I do have some questions. The first thing I wondered was, how far off the side of the road was her body? Was this guy walking deep into the woods, or were her remains literally right on the side of the road? Luckily, Jerry was able to give some clarification, and she explained that the spot Teresa's body was found was quite a ways off the side of the highway, and that she was left down in a ditch past the guardrail. So, knowing this, John Burlington had to intentionally walk a fair distance off the road to find her. It's absolutely not something that someone stopping off to take a quick leak would just stumble upon. Anyway, once police received this call, they responded out to that location immediately. 
while they're en route and only a few minutes after dispatch had hung up with John Burlington, a man walks into the police station, asking if authorities had located Teresa Corley's body. Uh, how would this guy know this? Police hadn't even gotten to the scene yet. I first toyed around with the idea that maybe this person had their own radio and heard police being dispatched, but I feel like that's a stretch. When really thinking about it, the more logical conclusion would be that either this guy was John Burlington or that he somehow knew what happened to Teresa. Hell, maybe even both. Yeah, when I first heard this, I was thinking the same thing, that it must have been the guy who called, just following up to make sure police took him seriously. But as we continued researching, we came across some information that was truly bizarre. John Burlington doesn't exist. You heard that right. The supposed businessman who is leading police to Teresa's remains is nobody. He's a total lie, created by whoever made that phone call. Now, sure, if you didn't want to jump to conclusions, you could think that maybe this person wanted to remain anonymous for whatever reason. Yeah, like maybe they were on the wrong side of the law before and were worried they'd be implicated in a murder investigation because of their past, but they felt compelled to call it in. So they lied about their identity. Sure, that's a reasonable line of thinking and totally possible. But then, who the hell is this guy coming into the station? And how would he know about the body? It wouldn't be too bright to call in an anonymous tip and then show up minutes later acting like it wasn't you that just called. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it turns out that the guy at police headquarters was named Ronnie, and he was part of a well-to-do family from Bellingham. He lived in a place owned by his parents where he supposedly partied on the regular with his buddies that were involved in the drug scene, one of those friends being Rick, Teresa's boyfriend at the time. It turns out that Ronnie and his family had some strong connections throughout the community. Maybe because of this, he'd heard something through the grapevine? Anyway, we'll get more into him later. As police arrive to the area described by Burlington, they find Teresa's body and review the crime scene. She'd been stripped naked with the jacket and jeans she had been last seen wearing, lying on the ground next to her, along with a pair of mismatched shoes. Once Teresa's remains were collected and an autopsy was performed, the medical examiner determined that she'd been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. It's unclear if the autopsy was able to decipher if the sexual trauma occurred around the time of her death or hours earlier at the Presidential Arms. Either way, the sexual assault would be one of police's strongest links to uncovering more information down the line. According to an article in Mass Live, Teresa's death certificate states that she died via asphyxiation by strangulation with a ligature. So not manual strangulation, like with the person's own hands, but with an object. It's never been released to the public, at least as far as I can tell, what item or even type of item was actually used to kill her. So, being the armchair detective I am, I started questioning some things. First, in terms of the murder weapon. Police keep things hush-hush and don't release much to the public, so it makes me wonder if the murder weapon had been left at the scene and was collected. And if it was, would they be able to collect DNA from it all these years later? I'd have to say it's possible, but unless they've kept this piece of evidence hidden for all this time, I think it's safer to assume that police are not in possession of the murder weapon. That's fair, but if they don't have it, could investigators at least determine what type of object she was killed with based on markings left on her body? It's been stated that the ligature had left a thin line on Teresa's neck. One might think if it were something like a rope or belt, anyone could have that in their possession. But what if it was something more unique, like something that could potentially link it to our killer based on their profession or a hobby? That's an interesting idea. Are you thinking, like, wire or something an electrician might have? Yeah, or maybe some type of line a fisherman would use. I don't know. I'm just spitballing, but thought it worth mentioning. I was also wondering, was Teresa killed in this exact spot on 495, or was she murdered somewhere else and the person or persons responsible transported her body in their vehicle and dumped her off the side of the highway? Then, at that point, could police have searched people's cars and attempted to obtain evidence that way? I'd have to guess that she was transported in a car and left there, but in order to start searching people's vehicles, investigators are going to need probable cause and warrants first. Well, Teresa was last seen around 5.30 a.m. Did the person responsible commit this crime during the day? That seems risky. And for where she was left after they killed her, does the fact that they're driving north mean anything? Does that mean that they were leaving the area and maybe heading home to somewhere north of Bellingham? Those are all valid questions. And lastly... 
I was really curious about what her time of death was. Was she killed in those early morning hours of the 5th after she was seen near the Dairy Queen? Or was she abducted and held for a period of time before being killed and then left off the highway? Does the ME have any information on that? Do we know if when she was found, there was any evidence indicating how long she'd been there? Unfortunately, these are things that even Jerry hasn't been able to fully uncover. Based on what she knows, Teresa was killed no later than December 6th. Which, yeah, that's still almost a whole day after she was last seen. If something like this hasn't been made clear yet, it probably won't ever be until someone with first-hand knowledge comes forward. That's what's so unfortunate and frustrating about this case. Jerry deserves answers to all of her questions. Regardless of justice, she truly just wants to know. Maybe one day someone will have the courage to come forward and give that to her. Now, with investigators having identified the body, the time had come to notify Teresa's family of their tragic findings. Authorities would arrive at the Corley's home in Bellingham during the evening hours of December 8th to tell her mother and siblings that Teresa had been killed. Jerry stated that all she could hear when police arrived was her mother screaming. I can't even begin to imagine the pain she must have felt after waiting days, longing for her daughter's safe return, only to be devastated by the news of her murder. Bellingham PD went on to partner with both Franklin and state police agencies during their search for clues. We know that throughout the years, authorities have gone on to interrogate many of the people who had connections to Teresa, including the men who may have been involved in the alleged sexual assault at the presidential arms, though with whatever information they had uncovered, it never seemed as though they were ready to make moves towards arresting those responsible for Teresa's death. As time passed, the investigation crawled forward at a snail's pace. Jerry made mention that it felt as though it never even got started, and I understand her frustration. When someone's so close to you, someone you love so much is murdered, you expect results. You'd hope that the investigators would be consumed by the case and spend every waking minute trying to solve it, just like you would. But the information police have provided Jerry and her family over the past few decades just wasn't good enough, and the time came for her to search for her own answers. She went on to start her own investigation. And we've got to say, this lady's got balls of steel. Now, as far as the information we'll be discussing, it won't be in chronological order as to how and when it was discovered. Instead, we've batched it together so it's easier to follow. So, with what happened at the Presidential Arms being one of, if not the most important event throughout this timeline, Jerry went on to track down and confront some of the people who may have been involved. Through her conversations with these individuals, she reveals information she's uncovered that we couldn't find anywhere else. And as disgusted as I was while listening to what these people had to say, I was only filled with more questions. So Jerry tells us that from what she's gathered, she believes that two of the men inside the presidential arms held Teresa down while another one raped her, but was unable to finish. That last bit is important going forward. As she continued detailing her findings, Jerry outlined an exchange she had with Steve, one of the men that picked Teresa up and brought her to the apartment. She stated that Steve professed he had nothing to do with what happened to Teresa, but conceded that it did appear as though she was being held there against her will. He went on, claiming that he couldn't have been involved in the sexual assault because he couldn't get it up. That makes you think, could Steve be the man that attempted to rape her but couldn't finish? As the conversation continued, Steve would go on to make some, in my opinion, seriously incriminating remarks. Apparently, he had the audacity to say, To Jerry's face, mind you. Something along the lines of, quote, why did she have to get so drunk? And if she hadn't gotten so drunk, essentially placing the blame on Teresa for what these guys did. And I'm sorry, but actually, no, I'm not sorry. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah, hearing him say something like that sure undermines his claims of having nothing to do with what happened to Teresa. Right? I can't believe Jerry didn't just punch this dude in the face right there. I agree, but I think she found an even better way to get back at him. Ooh, you're damn right she does. Listen to this. I made several phone calls. I actually sent him notes, and I would send him a Christmas card every year with Teresa's image and ask him to contact me because I had some questions. I love this lady, but moving on. Jerry didn't just unearth this new info about Steve, but she also learned some interesting things having to do with David, who was also in the car and inside the presidential arms. She stated that after Teresa made the comment about how she would have sex with these men if they'd let her go, David brought her into one of the bedrooms. A short time later, he came out with a scratch across his face. Now, it's important to remember, 
that even though Jerry got some of this information straight from the horse's mouth, it doesn't mean that it's factually accurate. Sure, it's definitely provided more insight into what happened that night, but we can't really take these guys at their word. Steve could be saying David did something that he very well could have done. It's not like just because he's willing to talk that he's being truthful about who did what. But I think it's fair to assume that the men inside that apartment had something to do with Teresa's murder, or at the very least, no more than they're letting on. Even so, none of these individuals have ever been charged. Over the course of this more than four decades long investigation, technology has, of course, drastically improved. And as most of us know, DNA testing wasn't a thing back in 78, leaving investigators with little physical evidence to work with. However, years and years after Teresa was murdered, police contacted the Corleys to inform them that they were able to obtain a DNA sample, which turned out to be semen from the genes found next to Teresa's body. With knowledge of this alleged sexual assault, there was potential that this DNA could very well be matched to one of those parties involved, or if another assault had taken place closer to the time of her murder, perhaps even help identify Teresa's killer. Jerry was able to give us a rundown of the whole situation regarding the DNA on the genes. She explained that the battle with the genes began in 2015. She met with the ADA as well as a crime lab employee who had been following the case closely. Jerry mentioned how this ADA seemed more hopeful than most, but at this time, it was determined that testing wasn't where it needed to be in order to ensure an accurate result. The sample was small and degraded, so it was decided that they would wait for further advancements before sending it in for testing. However, during this waiting period, Teresa's case went through a change of hands, which appeared to be a common occurrence over the years. Now, with newly appointed eyes overseeing the investigation, the whole thing needed to be re-reviewed before moving forward. You could hear the annoyance in her voice as Jerry talked about the setbacks this type of stuff caused. Over the years, every time someone new was put on the case, it was like taking a step backwards. The time eventually came where that DNA sample was sent out for testing. And guess what? Investigators had a match. Can you guess to who? David, the guy that was supposedly scratched by Teresa. Okay, one has to assume that with this new information, police can finally arrest someone and take a step closer to solving Teresa's murder. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. The new ADA assigned to Teresa's case claimed that even with this evidence, there was not enough information to put before a judge and obtain a conviction. In my mind, I'm thinking, when you put together statements from those that were inside the apartment during this alleged assault, with this DNA evidence, how can you not move forward with some type of charge? Sure, even if David had sexually assaulted Teresa, it doesn't mean he killed her. But if he felt the heat coming down on him, maybe he'd be more inclined to rat on someone to lessen his punishment. Well, what pissed me off beyond belief is what this ADA told Jerry. They said, quote, ejaculation does not equal penetration, end quote. Like, okay, I get it, they're not wrong, but to me, that just feels like a slap in the face, especially knowing that Teresa wasn't the type to sleep around. She'd only ever had two boyfriends. Why would she have this guy David's semen on her jeans? Wanting more answers and having seemingly nobody willing to help, Jerry is told by the ADA that if she wants to know what happened in the apartment, then to go ask the people herself. Taking the advice... Jerry threw her own investigation into high gear and did just that. I'll say it time and time again, this lady is a freaking rock star and I am beyond impressed by her and all she's done for her sister. She's talked to some scary people and she just keeps pushing and pushing to get answers. It's truly inspiring. Okay, back to the DNA. So we found out that it matched David, but authorities couldn't do crap with it. So now what? Well, apparently, after a more in-depth look, investigators locate even more evidence on the genes. There's DNA from an unknown male found on the zipper, which is gathered and sent out for testing. Authorities even went as far as completing genetic genealogy tests in order to obtain a match. But this time, it's not an answer they were hoping for. Turns out, the DNA on the zipper belonged to a freaking detective from the early days of the investigation, who must have touched the evidence with an ungloved hand. What the hell, dude? People just going around touching evidence all willy-nilly back in the day? This wasn't only a waste of time, but a costly mistake. This type of testing was not cheap. So, at this point, what more do they have? Well, having located a semen sample on Teresa's genes and 
believing that she had been sexually assaulted, investigators must have collected vaginal swabs, right? Right, they did. But like I've already said, testing wasn't a thing when they were collected, so they were just stored in evidence. Now, this next part is absolutely infuriating, but here goes. Before ever talking to Jerry, I saw a passage in an NBC article where she'd made some interesting statements about the police and the evidence in Teresa's case. She states, quote, There are several key pieces of evidence in Teresa's case that have been lost or accidentally destroyed, and there is more officials could do to push the case forward. Our family simply wants no stone left unturned. We just want everything done that can be done to find answers, and that has not happened, we think, end quote. Yep, I'm sure you know where this is going. So, through Jerry's own investigation, she learned that these swabs did in fact exist and were collected. But once state police got involved, things ended up being mishandled. Apparently, the swabs were taken and stored in a mortuary which housed tons of other rape kits and sexual assault evidence. I know, a freaking mortuary? Not the best setup back in the 70s and 80s. So the swabs go there and just sit, I guess? just thrown in with all the other evidence, which essentially had no rhyme or reason to it. Regardless, they exist and are there, hopefully with a proper label at least, but this is where things go real bad. At some unknown time and date, a fire engulfs the mortuary, and while the blaze is being extinguished, it's flooded with water, creating a catastrophic loss. It's believed that due to the damage done, no attempts were made to save any of the evidence stored there, What really frustrated me about the whole thing is that Teresa's vaginal swabs had supposedly been pretty well preserved. They were held between two pieces of glass and wrapped up and sealed appropriately. So even if there was this fire, then flood, there is absolutely the potential that they could have found this evidence laying in there and recovered it. But that was never done. Let's not gloss over the fact that it seems like nobody can locate any record of this fire ever happening. Right? That's the worst part of it all. How can you use that as an excuse for these missing swabs if you can't produce proof this fire flood actually even occurred? It's beyond infuriating. With the loss of these extremely valuable swabs, you might be thinking that investigators are out of options. But it seems like there's at least one more piece of evidence that could potentially have DNA linked to it. Remember how I said alongside Teresa's body, investigators located a pair of mismatched shoes? Well, these shoes appeared to be two different sizes one presumably a male's being much larger than the other. The shoes were these things called earth shoes, which were like this sort of moccasin or clog-looking type of shoe. They were popular back in the 70s, and they made them for both men and women, or I guess you could just consider them unisex. As police had been working through the case, they ended up at the presidential arms apartment. And guess what they found? Another pair of mismatched earth shoes. It's presumed that Teresa, during her hasty exit, had accidentally put on one wrong shoe when she fled the apartment. So once she leaves, you've got a possibly intoxicated Teresa wearing a man's shoe, trying to make her way home in the freezing cold after potentially being sexually assaulted? No wonder it took her so long to make it such a short distance. So where is this shoe? Well, around 1993, according to Jerry's memory, a police officer came to their home with a brown paper bag filled with evidence. Here's Jerry giving a little bit of a rundown of the situation regarding what happens with this officer. Um, But I have to say it was probably 1993. I remember because my daughter was small. I was able to still like hold her. And he wanted us to like look at some items to see if they might belong to Teresa. Mm -hmm. And so now here we have physical evidence that could potentially belong to my sister's case. He did pull out a jacket which yep, that could have been Teresa's, and he pulled on an earth shoe. And it was a large earth shoe. It was larger than what a woman would wear. Like, it was, it was like he had this bag of evidence that wasn't labeled, mm-hmm. and he's trying to figure out who it belongs to, or what case that could belong to, right? And so I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, it was reported that she was wearing, like, a corduroy jacket with plaid on it. I mean, was the jacket, yeah, that could have been hers, you know? Mm-hmm. Um but here he is touching it with his bare hands, <laughs> you know? <Jeez>. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. And who knows who touched now? it before that, too, so. Exactly. And where's the shoe now? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So that so, shoe that he showed you there, you, yeah. nobody knows where that shoe is now. So the last time I saw anything to do with the shoe, it was with a meeting with the Norfolk VA's office, and they took out a picture of the shoe. And it was an old picture. You know, it was like, 
It wasn't something current. It was like, like an old picture. It sure seems like this guy was just trying to figure out who this evidence belonged to. And if Teresa's family could identify them as hers, he may bring it back to the station and assign it to her case. Well, after that officer leaves, it's never seen again. How the hell can this happen so many times in one case? You can't tell me that if investigators were still in possession of the swabs and this shoe, which MVAC testing could potentially retrieve sweat DNA from, that this case wouldn't be worlds closer to being solved. Even if the evidence didn't provide enough probable cause to go after a murder conviction yet, at least it would point investigators towards people they could interrogate further and move forward from there. So here we are, two valuable pieces of evidence seemingly lost forever. As Teresa's case inches towards being unsolved for nearly half a century, some of the most important suspects are now deceased, others having left the area. However, Jerry and her family continue to push forward for answers. It's been reported that in 2017, with the investigation at a standstill, Jerry approached investigators and requested that they exhume Teresa's body to search for additional DNA evidence. A case from Maine had caught her eye, in which this action was taken and yielded successful results. As Jerry discussed this proposition with the ADA, she was told flat out that it was a dumb idea and that authorities already had perfectly good DNA to test, so there was no need to go through this process. When I heard this, I was thinking, it's been practically 40 years, and from what it seems, investigators didn't appear to be any closer to making an arrest than they had been during the early days. Why are you blackballing this family coming forward with a viable plan that's had proven results in other cases? Who knows what you may be able to find through doing this? And that's Jerry's whole thing too, the what ifs. What if you found DNA under her nails? Wouldn't that be indicative of some type of struggle? And what if that DNA turned out to be a match to a high-value suspect? What could that mean for the case? How could you shoot down the idea of even trying? Well, regardless of Jerry's feelings on the matter, the ADA refused to move forward with the process, leaving Jerry now holding the bag. If she were to contract someone to execute this operation, it would cost her $20,000. I was stunned by this number and asked her why it would cost so much. It turns out that the actual exhumation itself wasn't even the most expensive part. It was the forensic pathologist she would have had to hire privately to test anything they found. Aside from those costs, she'd also have to pay to have her sister reburied afterwards. So with Jerry facing down this gigantic cost, she does what she seemingly does best and she gets shit done. Just as she had finally gathered enough money through fundraising efforts, I shit you not, Jerry gets a call from the ADA who now says that they will take care of the exhumation and testing. Well, I'll be damned. They came to their senses, eh? You might say came to their senses, but I'm of the opinion that the ADA was shocked by Jerry's persistence, and when they saw that she was going to be able to do the work herself, they didn't want to be on the receiving end of bad press if anything were to come of it after denying her request. Oh, I for sure agree. But either way, it saved Jerry a pretty penny while still getting the job done. Something that really aggravated me, though, was when she told us that it only cost the ADA's office $2,500 to complete the whole thing. Honestly, the fact that they were refusing to exhume her, knowing that's how inexpensive the process was to them, is sickening. Now, I'm sure you're curious what Jerry did with the 20 k she'd raised in Teresa's name. It turns out that she donated the money to Pawtucket, a city in Rhode Island, for them to obtain an MVAC system, which tests for touch DNA. She said it was a pay-it-forward type thing, which I just love. So, after the ADA's change of heart, the exhumation takes place. Now, I had known about this being done prior to speaking with Jerry, and my first thought was, there's no freaking way they'd be able to get any useful DNA after nearly 40 years. She was buried in 1978. I'd assume the remains were probably only skeletal at this point. Turns out, I know way less about DNA collection than I thought I did, because it seems as though investigators were able to retrieve evidence that was worth testing. According to Dr. Robin Cotton, who's the Director of Biomedical Forensic Science at Boston University, and who also testified for the prosecution in the O.J. Simpson trial, would discuss the potential for the DNA collection in Teresa's case, and she stated, quote, It all depends on how many cells were there, and what condition they're in now, end quote. It's stated in an article with Boston 25 News, and also confirmed by Jerry, that authorities were able to collect nine and a half fingernails and sent them off for DNA testing. I had no idea that fingernails would actually still be intact on a deceased person's body decades later. You really do learn something new every day. So this seemed to be great news. 
If Teresa had fought back against any of her assailants, whether that be those who sexually assaulted her or her murderer, then these fingernail samples may be the one thing left, outside of a confession, that could help solve her case. Over four years had passed since this evidence was sent out to be examined, yet as I looked for answers, it seemed like there was little to no information out there as to what happened with it. After some digging, I was able to learn that, unfortunately, the samples failed to yield anything. One of the articles I read through was one written by Bob Ward for Boston 25 News. Now, if the name Bob Ward sounds familiar to any of our listeners, good ears. Bob was actually the reporter who interviewed Kenny Pont back when we talked about the New Bedford Highway serial killer. His article about Teresa Corley was released during the 40th anniversary of her murder. It paints a picture of who Teresa was, the things she did, and oddly enough, details the fact that Bob knew her personally. He disclosed that he and Teresa had worked together at Star Market in Franklin all those years ago, and even goes on to describe the last time he remembered seeing her alive. He writes, quote, It's a fleeting memory of a pretty girl, full of life, who shared a little greeting as she bounced down a supermarket aisle headed to whatever adventure awaited, end quote. Just reading this again makes me so sad. Teresa had so much life ahead of her, and some monster took it away. She deserved so much better, and it breaks my heart every single time we talk about her. This article also talked about the DNA evidence and what happened with it. It's written here that, as we know, the fingernails were unable to provide useful information, but that, after further examination of Teresa's genes, another DNA sample, described as a, quote, YSTR profile of an unidentified male, was located. It's unclear if this was the sample that belonged to the detective who had mishandled the evidence. Even though I had my doubts about finding anything valuable from Teresa's body 40 years later, I can honestly say that I would have done the same thing if she were my sister. So, it appears as though, out of all the DNA evidence that had been gathered and made public knowledge, all we're left with is David Seaman found on Teresa's jeans. It's understandable that the fingernails provided no value. That was a long shot, but... What I'm still hung up on are those allegedly destroyed vaginal swabs and the mysterious vanishing shoe. Continuing along the same vein, there's one more interesting thing about another missing item, and it has to do with the whole John Burlington scenario. Apparently, the dispatcher who answered Burlington's phone call kept detailed notes in a logbook. Then, sometime during the investigation, someone attempted to locate said notes, and when they went back through the logbook, the pages they needed were nowhere to be found while annotations from other calls were all still present. Yeah, another instance of something related to the case just disappearing. I mean, come on. At this point, you've got to be asking, is this all really just coincidence, or was some of this done purposefully? Well, even with those notes having gone missing, it's believed that the dispatcher who took the call from John Burlington had, at some point, made claims that they were sure the person on the other end of that line was Ronnie. I mean... I think we were already under the assumption that this was the case, but hearing it from this dispatcher, who I'd assume must have known Ronnie well enough to identify him by voice, really starts to solidify that belief. So, did someone get rid of those detailed notes so they couldn't be used to try and catch Ronnie in a lie somewhere down the line? Or were they torn out and given to someone, eventually just being misplaced somehow? Jerry made mention that years ago, someone had told her that the, quote, powers that be never wanted this case solved. Even though this wasn't backed by fact, who could this person have been talking about if it were true? Perhaps someone with even more reach than the police? Someone with power and influence? We don't know what happened 43 years ago during this investigation, and I'm sure most of the people that worked the case back then aren't interested in talking about it, even if they're still around. But any person looking into this is going to say that there are some seriously questionable happenings, especially when you look at the evidence that was lost and some of the connections between the people involved. No, we're not accusing anyone of wrongdoing, far from it, but you've got to be willing to ask hard questions in the search for truth. With that said, let's give a quick rundown on some of the connections we alluded to and postulate how they could have influence in this case. Forewarning, there's a lot of names, but we'll do our best to keep this coherent. So, Steve and John from the apartment. Both of these guys were related by marriage to a Bellingham police detective. I think this one speaks for itself. Blood's thicker than water type thing. There's also rumor that, at some point, Steve had gone to an apartment complex called Alpine Place to look for someone. And who lived there, you ask? Rick. It's unclear when this occurred, but something to note, nonetheless. 
Interestingly enough, Rick the drug dealer had an uncle who was a Franklin police detective. It's alleged that Rick overheard what had happened to Teresa while he was at a party and went on to divulge that information to his uncle. Could he have done this to try and cover up his involvement, sort of like an alibi? Or maybe it was a lie and he had gone to his uncle begging for help. Now we get to Ronnie, who was supposedly not only dealing drugs back in the 70s, but also using. This in turn connected him to Rick, Teresa's boyfriend. Ronnie also had an uncle named Ducky who lived above a local diner, which was owned by Ronnie's influential family. This diner was located across from the old Bellingham police station, and it's been stated the officers frequented the establishment. There have been rumors that Ronnie and Ducky may have been inside the presidential arms apartment during the time of the sexual assault. Now, supposedly Ducky drove trucks for a medical company, delivering supplies to a local hospital. It's believed that he would have been out and about before 6 a.m., and his route for the delivery could have very well taken him onto Route 495 North. Apparently, police had mentioned that at some point, Ducky and Ronnie were both identified as suspects. Out of all these connections, the one that stands out most seems to be the relationship between Ronnie and Ducky, and the diner being across from the old police station. If they had anything to do with what happened at the Presidential Arms, or even just knowledge of it, and had gone back to Ducky's afterwards, they could have had a bird's eye view of the PD around the time Teresa was dropped off there. And if they had any reason to do her harm, they could have planned it from there with Ducky disposing of her body on his way up 495. So, with all of that laid out, I think most of you are at the point where you're asking yourselves, what the hell happened here? And that's a damn good question, and one we're still pondering as well. We know a lot of the timeline, and a fair amount of specifics, but every time you find out one new little tidbit, it sends your mind off in a million different directions, trying to make sense of it all. I think it's safe to say that the truth lies with one of the people we've talked about, whether it be because they're responsible or at least have knowledge of who was. Now, before we go any further into speculation, I just wanted to touch on something that came off pretty eerie. Jerry mentioned that throughout the years, there have been rumors of individuals making threats to people, claiming that they'd, quote, kill them like they killed Teresa Corley. But like I said, these are only rumors and may be exaggerated or totally fictitious. It's a little hard to believe that someone would go around saying something like that while there's still an ongoing investigation into the murder, but it would lend to the idea that maybe the person making those threats had power and influence, and felt as though they could say and do what they want without consequence. But who knows? It doesn't seem like any of those claims amounted to anything, even if they were true. So now, let's try to figure out some type of conclusion based on what we've learned. We'll start with Steve, the guy who had the gall to try and blame Teresa for what happened because she'd gotten drunk. While the comments he made to Jerry did fill some holes, he never really admitted to anything. He had also given a statement to police, but that hasn't been released publicly, so we have no idea what details it may contain. I think we can assume, though, that he didn't admit anything incriminating to investigators. From there, let's talk about David. He sure seems like he had a lot more to do with what happened than anyone is saying. I mean, they found his freaking semen on Teresa's jeans. So, it appears that he had sex with her, willingly or otherwise, which could provide motive for wanting her silenced. Maybe he got nervous and didn't want to get in trouble if he had forced himself on her. There's even speculation that someone from the apartment went out looking for Teresa after she left. So could it have been him? Could he have found her in front of the police station, thinking she was going to report what happened, and then waited until he had an opportunity to abduct her near the Dairy Queen and subsequently killed her? But then what about Mike? the guy that was supposedly banging on the door of the apartment after he got kicked out. Could he have been upset that he never got to have sex with Teresa, so he found her after she left and tried to sexually assault her? Maybe she defended herself and a struggle ensued, ending with Mike strangling her to death. A lot of the information around Mike was provided by Steve, so who knows how accurate it really is, especially when it seemed to be contradicted by Mike's cousin's statement of how he was trying to get back in to help Teresa. Regardless, Jerry tried getting in touch with Mike to see what he had to say for himself, but apparently now he's a schizophrenic, and his father told her that he had already been interviewed by police and he wasn't going to talk anymore. Now, this doesn't mean he was a schizophrenic back in 78. Could the trauma of murdering someone or seeing someone murdered have caused it? Either way, he could still have memories of what happened. Jerry made a great point, saying that there are very high-functioning schizophrenics, which I agree with. Depending on the severity of his mental illness, I don't think there's really any other reason he shouldn't be able to speak about the incident. But if Jerry's already been shut down by his father once, I doubt we'll ever know what he has to say unless he decides to come forward on his own. Now we get to Ronnie, 
And boy, does he have a lot of mystery surrounding him, even aside from the whole John Burlington thing. We found out that Ronnie wasn't interviewed by police for the first time until April 6, 1989, 11 years after the murder. What the hell is up with that? Through muckrock.com, we were able to read this thoroughly redacted interview, which essentially offers no valuable information due to how much of the content had been blacked out. As frustrating as this was, we're not done with Ronnie. While speaking with Jerry, she told us that a man named Ken Maines, who's a cold case consultant, looked into Teresa's case. Interested in what he had to say, we looked him up. He's posted some YouTube videos on the subject, and while listening to his deep dive regarding this case, we learned a few things that hadn't come up in conversation with Jerry. In regards to Ronnie, he made mention that he'd been picked up on a DUI at some point, and when speaking with police, he openly admitted to having information pertaining to Teresa's murder. He went on to claim that he was not the one responsible, but he knew who was. As the interviewing officer attempted to coax Ronnie into providing more detail, the chief of police at the time came into the room, ordering that the conversation be recorded with both video and audio. At this time, Ronnie clammed up and refused to continue the conversation. It's unclear if this interview is the same as the heavily redacted transcript we spoke of earlier. When I heard about the DUI interview, I was furious, and I'm sure those interviewing officers were too. It seems like Ronnie was on the cusp of giving some potentially crucial information that could finally lead authorities towards solving Teresa's case, and this chief had to barge in, demanding it be recorded. For what? It wasn't a confession, it was knowledge of another person's involvement. At bare minimum, they could have treated this as a credible tip to follow up on, never needing it to be authenticated through audio and video. On top of that, I'm sure the officers who were conducting the interview could have sworn to Ronnie's statement being true, even if he refused to put it in writing or reiterate it a second time to be recorded. These weren't the only statements by Ronnie we've learned about, though. Again, via muckrock.com, we read through another redacted transcript covering an interview from April 25th, 2006, between Ronnie and two mass state troopers. It states that they gathered DNA from Ronnie, which he provided voluntarily prior to questioning. During their conversation... Troopers asked Ronnie if he had, quote, placed that call to Bellingham PD, end quote. I assume here they had to be talking about the John Burlington situation. It went on to say that Ronnie denied doing so, which I found interesting. I'm surprised that he still claims he wasn't the one who called, even nearly 30 years later. But in retrospect, if he admitted to it, it'd pretty much implicate him by having knowledge of where the body was located. Anyway, as we continued reading, Ronnie's statements led us to believe that he's not very trustworthy. He goes on to say that he wants to help in any way possible, and that once he moves back to Massachusetts, he'd like to meet with the Corley family to, quote, dispel any of their fears. Maybe I'm just a skeptic, but he seems like he's trying to be overly helpful while not really doing so, almost like he's attempting to remove suspicion from himself. He's all over the place. He wants to help any way he can, but he's not coming forward with the information he supposedly had during the interview Ken Maines talked about. Sure seems like it's just lip service. Anyway, one of the last lines in the transcript is what really made me start to question Ronnie's credibility. The transcript states that when speaking to the troopers, Ronnie had, quote, said all he had to say, that we weren't going to pin the murder on him, and he was ending the interview so he could go buy some crack, end quote. Yeah. So this was the last bit of information I could find where Ronnie was involved with police in regards to Teresa's case. And it turns out that he died just a couple months later, on June 15, 2006, taking anything he may have known with him. And that's one of the most frustrating parts of these old cases, having many of the important suspects either leaving the area or dying before we can find out everything they knew. With that being said... Even with Ronnie's credibility in question, I still, unfortunately, believe he was one of the biggest keys to solving this case. I think throughout the years, guilt of what he knew or did weighed heavily on him. It's rumored that he often chatted with bartenders, talking about how he needed to get something off his chest, but that, quote, if he does, everything will come undone. What would have come undone? Your life? Your relationships with friends? Your family? Could this have been swept under the rug through their influence for all these years, and because of that, he felt a duty to protect them? The possibilities seem endless. Jerry is doing all she can to piece everything together and has a relatively good idea of what happened the night her sister was killed. But some things are still missing. There are holes in the story that she would love to have filled. As much as I believe she wants closure for her sister and family, 
More than anything, I think she just wants to know the truth, regardless of how tough a pill it is to swallow. So, I'm sure you're wondering where things are at now. There's clearly been a lot of highs and lows throughout the years, with no evidence ever being good enough to move forward with murder charges, let alone a conviction. But there is still hope. There's a unit within the state police called the Unresolved Unit, which is essentially a group of detectives that take time to go through old cases, such as Teresa's, with a fine-tooth comb to see if there's any more that can be done. When we heard about this, we said, yes, send it there. This is exactly what's needed right now, and that's precisely what Jerry's fighting for. You might be thinking, she's fighting for it? Why should this have to be a fight? Wouldn't it be the most logical step to take if authorities want this case to be solved? And we thought the same thing. But Jerry told us that when she requested her sister's case be sent there, she was told, quote, absolutely not. Perplexed, I asked why. Apparently, in order to have a case sent to this unit, it has to have truly gone cold, which those overseeing Teresa's case claim it has not and say it's still being worked on. I found this to be a crock of shit personally. There comes a point where you have to seriously differentiate working on something with making meaningful movement. You can't say that just because someone opens a case folder and makes a phone call once a month that it's being actively worked on, you need to be getting results. Jerry doesn't give up, though, and she continues to call the investigators every six months while entering regular FOIA requests to get their attention and continue working on her own investigation. The last update that she's gotten regarding her sister's case is in regards to the MVAC testing we've talked about before, which is essentially touch DNA. It appears as though police have some objects that they're going to be testing, but they haven't given any real specifics on what those items are. Jerry tells us it's been months now since they told her about this, and pretty soon, she'll be making her semi-annual call to figure out what's going on. Hopefully by then, police are able to give her some good news. Me personally, I'm hoping that they do have possession of the murder weapon, and that if they can connect it to someone, closure for Jerry and her family should be right around the corner. In recent years, a billboard had been erected on Route 140 in Franklin, Mass., near the Rentham Line. It featured Teresa's senior year school photo and stated, Seeking Information, 1978 Franklin Murder, along with a phone number for the Norfolk DA's tip line in bold lettering. Even with the lack of Bellingham being mentioned on the billboard, it was great to see it up spreading the word. Today, if you were to visit the location of where Teresa's body was found, you'd find a cross planted as a memorial. Inscribed above her name are the words, always in our heart, and below, an omen for those responsible, Leviticus 24.17, which, in the King James Version of the Bible, states, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. I truly believe we need to do all we can to bring awareness to cases like Teresa's, and if possible, keep them in the media. I understand that as years pass, some people forget but it's a disservice to the ones lost and their families if we don't continue to talk about them or try to look for answers. Teresa, along with countless others, deserve justice, and their loved ones, answers and hopefully closure. These older cases are just as important as those that happen today, and we can't fall into the mindset that because it's been so long that they can't be solved. The more attention a case receives, the more tips come in, and the more likely someone who knows something may be pressured into coming forward. I think we can all take some pointers from Jerry. If you've got a potential suspect that's not talking, maybe send them a reminder to let them know you're still thinking about them. Before we finish up, I just wanted to talk about fate and how sometimes things are just meant to happen. While having a previous iteration of this script almost completed, John and I were driving down a Massachusetts highway when a car caught our eye. As it slowly crept past, we were shocked at what we saw a Justice for Teresa Corley bumper sticker prominently displayed right in front of us. While talking to Jerry, we all came to the same conclusion, that this must have been a sign. Maybe even Teresa trying to bring us together to have this conversation. It's now been 43 years since Teresa's murder, and somebody out there knows what happened. Her family, especially Jerry, deserve answers. It doesn't matter that 43 years have passed. Like, anytime is a good time to come forward, you you know, and my whole hope is, of course, is to keep the case out there, even though it's 43 years old, and to jog a memory, Um, or just for somebody to say, all right, I've, I've had enough, you know, let me bring it forward. If you have any information regarding those involved in the murder of Teresa Corley, no matter how small a detail, either pass that information along to Jerry, or if you'd prefer to remain anonymous, please call the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office 
at 781-830-4800 or the Massachusetts State Police tip line at 617-593-8840. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at Wicked Deeds Pod and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode. <laughs>